we have lecture number four on uh, critical, critical systems and three dimensional, real physical critical systems and three dimensional. Three -dimensional. Well. <laughs> 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 Um, okay, just one second. I need to. I had one sheet of paper somewhere. Okay. Okay, this is what I want. Um, okay, so this is some of the stuff that um, um, we discussed uh, yesterday. Um, so if we have identical scalars, in a three-dimensional CFT, um, the four-point function looks like this. Um, so it's some prefactor and then some function of u and v, where u and v are conformally invariant cross ratios. And this four-point function, if the scalars are identical, satisfies a crossing equation, which is v to the delta phi g of uv minus u to the delta phi g of vu equals zero. Um, and if we further um, use the conformal block decomposition of the four-point function, we can rewrite this crossing equation as a sum over primaries, conformal primaries appearing in the phi times phi OPE. There's some OPE coefficient squared times some function of uh, u and v that depends on um, delta and L. Maybe I should say for identical scalars, this function doesn't depend on delta phi, but if the scalars are not identical, then the, it would also depend on delta phi. It would depend on differences of the scaling dimensions of the external operators. Um, in any case, this is determined by group theory. What's not determined by group theory is what exactly what, what operators appear in the sum and with what coefficients. But that's still pretty good because um, we can um, still rule out um, various possible uh, spectra for the CFD. Here I rewrote that equation by isolating the identity operator and assuming that, phi, that F phi phi identity is equal to one. That's just, just a normalization condition for phi. And here this is a sum over all the other operators, all the other conformal primaries, not the identity operator. And then if we can find a functional uh, such that when acting, a linear functional, such that when acting on F00, we get one. There's just a normalization condition for the functional. And if the functional acting on scalar operators of dimension delta bigger than some value, delta star, is positive. And if the functional acting on the, the Fs corresponding to all other operators of spin bigger than zero is positive where the dimension satisfies the unitarity bound. If we can find a func such a functional, then if we apply this functional to this equation using the fact that this is positive in the unitary theory, we see that this equation cannot be obeyed. So um, that implies that the lowest dimension scalar appearing in the phi times phi OB has dimension smaller than delta star. So this way we find an upper bound on um, the scaling dimension. And then we can optimize over alpha so that we find the best bound. And um, this is the sort of plot that um, one uh, gets. Um, and the important features is that if it starts at the free theory here and it goes up and there's a kink precisely where the 3D Ising model is, and then it does other things. And I explained last time that if we do something a little more complicated, we, you, we don't just look at a single, um, the, the four-point function of a single operator, but a mixed correlator system, then we find an allowed island around, around this point. It's an interesting question whether the island can actually shrink to zero size, but I think people believe that's true. Okay. Um, so I want to make some comments about this method. Um, so, and then talk about other examples. Um, so, note, if we know um, 
one of the OP coefficients, one or more, the OP coefficients, say <coughs> F phi phi O tilde for some operator O tilde, um, then we can improve the, the bounds uh, in the following way. So um, I ca I'm going to rewrite this equation by isolating not just the identity, the contribution from the identity, but also the contribution from O tilde. So suppose O tilde has dimension delta tilde and spin L tilde. So F zero zero plus F delta tilde L tilde plus some, sorry, forgot to write the OP coefficient that we know, phi phi O tilde squared plus sum of over all the other operators, F phi phi O squared F delta L, where delta and L are the scaling dimension and the spin of this operator O is equal to zero. And then we can, um, uh, in order to exclude assumptions about the spectrum, so then in order to exclude a possible spectrum, find a linear function alpha such that the following, um, find alpha, well, with the same conditions as here, except that uh, instead of alpha acting on the identity operator being normalized to one. Um, sorry, so where instead of this, we use the normalization condition alpha acting on this combination is equal to one. F zero zero plus F phi phi O tilde squared F delta L delta tilde L tilde uh, is equal to one. Uh, yeah. Um, I want one of the terms in the sum to be strictly bigger than zero, not greater or equal. If everybody's greater or equal than zero, then that's not good enough. The fact that it's one, it doesn't, doesn't matter. It could be any number, but it should be strictly, strictly bigger than zero. Yes. Okay, so this is one comment that one can actually improve these bounds if we know the values of some of the OP coefficients. Of course, in the 3 dizing model, we don't. Well, using the bootstrap, maybe we can, we can find them, but a priori, there's no calculation that uh, gives them. Um, and another thing that I want to say, uh, well, there are theories in which we can calculate some of the OP coefficients, and I'll explain that um, hopefully uh, if I have time and some supersymmetric theories. One can actually compute some OP coefficients. And in those cases, one can actually improve um, this method in this, in this way. Um, right, so this would be a three-point function. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, presumably from a simulation that would also be, be possible. Um, I think for the Ising model now, we know some of the OP coefficients thanks to the bootstrap. Um, okay, and I want to say another thing about the OP coefficients. Then we can find, can find bounds if we don't know the OP coefficients. We can find bounds on OP coefficients using a slight variation of that uh, method. And it's as follows. Let's just uh, suppose we want to find a bound on this OP coefficient, <coughs> F phi phi O tilde. So let's just write that term first. F phi phi O tilde squared, F delta tilde L tilde. And let's just put everybody else on the right-hand side. Minus F zero zero, minus sum over the other operators, primaries. F phi phi O squared, F delta L. So this is, this equation is true. Okay, and uh, now the idea is, um, if I was better at uh, using these boards, I think that would be good, but unfortunately I'm not. Um, so 
I'm just going to write it here, find alpha such that alpha acting on f delta tilde l tilde is equal to 1. So it's normalized a little differently from there. And um, alpha uh, on f delta l is bigger than 0 for all the other O's, not the identity, or the operator whose OB coefficient we want to find a bound on. So if we can find an alpha that satisfies these two conditions, then if we apply alpha to this equation, alpha acting on this F is equal to 1 by normalization. Alpha acting on this is positive. So this whole term here, because of the minus sign, um, is less than 0. So this implies that f phi phi o squared is less than minus alpha applied to the um, identity. So if we find an alpha with these conditions, satisfying these conditions, then we can just evaluate alpha on the contribution from the identity, and we find an upper bound on the OB coefficient squared. So then optimize over alpha and find to find the best bound. Okay. So that's another thing one can use this uh, method for. And as I said before, in some superconformal field theories, one can actually calculate exactly some of the OB coefficients. Okay. Other questions about this? So then I want to explain a couple of generalizations. Yes? Uh, is that O or O tilde? O tilde, O tilde. I'm sorry. Do I have O tilde? Yeah, I have O tilde there. Yeah. Yes? That's true. This thing would work regardless of whether O is O tilde is isolated or not. You still get a bound. Um, it's possible to also get, so this is, for using this, this way of doing it, you get an upper bound. It's also possible, if there's a gap above this operator O tilde, then it's also possible to get a lower bound on this OP coefficient. So I think, what's that? Yeah, you have to know the gap. So for example, in supersymmetric theories, if there are some representations that are um, protected and they're completely isolated, sometimes they're completely isolated from the continuum of representations. And for, um, for those OP coefficients, you can find upper and lower bounds. Okay, so some generalizations. And uh, I want to make a connection with what I talked about in the first. Is there more chalk? Yeah, OK, here. Um, in the first lecture, so the first generalization is um, for uh, CFTs with um, ON flavor symmetry. and a scalar phi i, scalar primary, scalar primary phi i, um, where i goes from 1 to n. And the vector representation of O n. So this way we could make contact with these critical O n models. So what's different in that case? Well, we look at the four-point function of these operators. So phi i, phi j, phi k, phi l. 
where the indices go from 1 to n. And of course, the four point function uh, vanishes, it doesn't vanish only if uh, the in these indices are contracted so that we have a singlet under the flavor symmetry. Um, and um, there are several ways of contracting these indices. And I'm going to write it like this. So delta ij delta kl times gs of u and v plus delta il delta jk minus delta i uh, l delta, sorry, delta i k delta j l g a of u and v plus um, delta i j del delta, sorry, delta i k delta j l plus delta i l delta j k minus 2 over n delta i j delta k l um, g t of u and v. And now I should explain why I did this. The idea is that when we take this OPE, so let's just take this OPE and that OPE and expand this four point function in conformal blocks. If we take this first OPE, there's some operators O that can appear in this OPE. This, these operators in general transform under ON. How can they transform under ON? Well, they can transform in any reducible component of this product of two vector representations. So O can be an ON singlet. I'll call that S. On ON, so in the product of two vector representations, we get a singlet. If we contract the indices, we can get a anti-symmetric tensor or a traceless symmetric tensor. So ON singlet, ON anti-symmetric tensor, I'll call that A, and symmetric traceless, and I'll call that T. So then the way I wrote these, um, th this four-point function is such that when we expand this GS, GA, and GT in conformal blocks, the only operators that contribute here would be the ones that are singlets under ON, here there would be the ones that are anti-symmetric tensors, and here would be the ones that are symmetric traceless tensors. Um, you can check, for instance, that, you know, this structure here is anti-symmetric anti under interchanging I and J. So it's just anti-symmetric tensors that contribute when we take this OP. This one is symmetric under interchanging I and J, and it's also traceless if we contract I with, if we set J equal to I and sum over them, we get zero because of this thing here. So the, this corresponds to symmetric traceless tensors. Okay, so this is slightly more complicated, but this is sort of how theories with global symmetries are going to be studied. So then even before we expand and conformal box, we can still write down the crossing equations. So crossing meaning interchanging 1 and 3. So previously, if we had one, only one operator, crossing just um, uh, relates g of uv to g of vu. In this case, we have three functions, gs, ga, and gt. So crossing will mix together gs, ga, and gt. So we have, um, and we get three crossing equations. Three equations. Anyway, and then one can expand and conform our blocks, GS, GA, and GT, and uh, use a similar um, method. Can they find a functional such that we exclude some possible spectra. 
And uh, I'm not going to go over that in detail again, um, but I'll just show you the plot. So we can find an upper bound on um, delta S, which is the dimension of the lowest ON singlet operator that appears in the OPE of phi i and phi j. And the bound looks like this. Um, so this point here is 1 half 2. This point here is 1 half 1. And then something like that. I'm plotting the bounds for various values of n. And so these are upper bounds. Okay. Uh, so this is as a function of the dimension of phi i. So this is done by Coase, Poland, and Simmons Duffin. Okay. And this would be, for instance, for n equal one. This is like the Ising case n equal 2, n equal 3, and so on. And you can do it at very, the very large end. The bound just goes very, very, uh, is very steep here, and then it goes like that. Okay? So, as you might expect, these kinks are exactly where the critical ON vector models are supposed to be. Yes? No, no, it's the same for any n. So the way n appears, it appears in the crossing equations as a parameter. And the reason why it appears there is because it appears in this structure for symmetric traceless tensors. This is the only place where n appears. So can we take n to infinity first before doing the numerics? Um, I'm not 100% sure. Possibly, yeah, I don't see why not. And then presumably you'll just start here, right? So if you if you recall, okay. So let me, let me just explain why this corresponds to the critical ON models. So if you recall, the action was something like this: some kinetic term, some mass term that we tune. Um, so we tune this in order to reach the critical point, and some quartic coupling, phi i phi i um, quantity squared. Um, and at large n, this theory is solvable. Delta phi i approaches one half. It's very much like a free theory as far as these phi i's go. The only difference between this and a free theory is that this O n singlet, the operator phi i phi i, its dimension goes to two instead of one. In a free theory, it would be one. So you can see very nicely that um, as n goes up, uh, this kink approaches on the y-axis, it approaches 2. And then if in this case one um, looks at mixed correlators, again, one can find islands, but the islands aren't as um, small as for the um, Ising model. Yes? Sorry, again? Could there be another theory that, uh, that, have, that has ON symmetry? Yeah, same yeah there, prob there are probably many theories with ON symmetry. But the idea, I mean, you know, there are also many theories with scalar operators. <laughs> so you, have, you, could have, you could ask the same thing about the Ising case. Like, why is it that it's this theory that we're seeing? Um, well, probably in some sense it's like the simplest theory. Um, I don't have I don't have a good ex explanation why these are the theories. Um, it's like the the most minimal theory with this amount of with this symmetry. Um, right, right, right. So if you if you think that there aren't that many CFTs because of universality, then maybe um, maybe that would that would be an explanation. Um, 
as far as far as the numerics go, like it's not. Right. Um, yeah. By the way, one can actually continue these things. So the the scaling, the space-time dimension also appears a parameter as a parameter in the expressions for a conformal blocks, and one can continue this across dimensions. And one can check that the the scaling for the Ising model interpolates between the 2D Ising model in 2D and the free theory in 4D. Um, these ones uh, also go to a free theory in 4D. Uh, I think they disappear at some point between 2D and 3D. Yeah. So we mentioned that uh, a water or magnets. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I'm not going to remember the you know specific materials, but. Um, so th the Ising cases for uniaxial magnets, where the spins um, can be oriented and um, preferentially along one direction, n equal two would be relevant for x y magnets, where the spins can be oriented somewhere in a plane, anywhere in a plane, and the n equal three case would be relevant for um, Heisenberg magnets, where the spins can be oriented anywhere in three dimensions. For higher values of n, I'm not really sure. Um, but it's interesting to study these theories because, especially because at large end they're solvable. Okay. Okay, so this is another case where there's a kink just like in the Ising model. And I wanted to then to show you another one that's a little more involved and I just want to get you, uh, give you a um, feel for how much more involved it is. Um, so the second generalization would be uh, to external operators with spin. And I'll just do one example. So example is um, fermionic operators I'll just call them psi. And they have a spinner index, alpha, goes from one to two. And um, I'm gonna look at the theories like this also with um, O-N global symmetry. So I'm gonna have N flavors of this. So I'm just put an index I, where I goes from one to N. And alpha goes from one to two. So just a spinner index in three dimensions. And um, um, I can take these operators to be real, so Mayorana. Um, and um, they would transform in the vector representation of ON. Okay? Of course, these are two ingredients here. Uh, one of them is that we no longer have scalars, we have spinners, and uh, we no longer have just one scalar, we have N of them. So it's good to just take them one at a time. So first, let's just do uh, one fermion. So you can look at the four-point function, psi alpha, psi beta, psi gamma, psi delta. And this can be expanded in conformal blocks just like a scalar four-point function. The difference now is that we have to keep track of these spinner indices. So 1 over x12 to the 2 delta psi, x34 to the 2 delta psi, times some function of u and v, but also multiplied by some ex extra function of position that also depends on these spinner indices. So there are several ways of building um, conformally invariant structures. And in this case, there's five of them, so I goes from one to five. And T, I'm just gonna call these structures alpha, beta, T, alpha, beta, gamma, delta, with the index I. They depend on the X's times uh, functions G, I of U and V. And 
And um, these functions gi of u and v, okay, so, so, so far this is, this is what the four-point function uh, looks like. Uh, we can think of these uh, t's as various ways of contracting the, these spinner indices. Maybe multiply them by um, coordinates as well. Um, okay. Uh, the fact that there's five of them assumes uh, parity. So this assumes parity. If we don't have parity, without parity, um, I would go from 1 to 16. So you can see that even for, you know, the simple generalization of, um, uh, you know, go operators of scalars, you know, like fermions. Even for fermions in 3D, um, uh, it easily can get out of control because there would be lots of structures. Yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the, the, the four point structures, yeah, the number is, is bounded, even for operators with higher uh, spin. Um, okay, and now each GI can be decomposed, expanded in conformal blocks. These are different conformal blocks and the conformal blocks for um, scalars. Um, so how many conformal blocks are there? Um, well, we can try to think about it. So conformal blocks correspond to this OPE decomposition. So we should try to understand what this uh, OPE decomposition could look like. Um, so what kind of operators can appear? And so for that, we should look at the three-point function, psi alpha, psi beta, times some operator of dimension delta spin L. So it has space -time L space-time indices. It's a traceless symmetric tensor. And uh, in the scalar case, this was just um, proportional to the OP coefficient times some function of position, right? But in when, when we have spinners instead of scalars, they're actually the same operator can appear with different OP coefficients. So the way this looks is that, um, it looks like this, lambda psi psi O A. So each operator has different OP coefficients that they differ in the way we contract these indices, alpha, beta, and these mu's, and also um, the, with the func potentially with functions of position. So it looks like this, R alpha, beta, mu1 through mu l. It depends on A, so they're different three-point structures. This also depends on x times some function of position. Well, I guess like if I can, if I say that this depends on x, I can just leave it like that. So one one other difference is that um, they're different. Each operator has different OP coefficients, and it just so happens that in this case, okay, so a goes from one to four, one, two, three, four. And these are parity even. So a parity even operator O only has OP coefficients with indices one or two, and these are parity odd. There's three point structure for parity odd operators. And then these functions G I of U and V can be written as a sum over A and B. Lambda psi psi O A, lambda psi psi O B times G delta L um, 
and he has three indices, I, A, and B. And this is a function of um, U and V. So what's complicated in this case is that you have to, in order to figure out what the conformal blocks are, so these are the conformal blocks. These are conformal blocks. In order to figure out the conformal blocks, you have to keep track both of the four-point structures and the three-point structures. So you can imagine that even computing the conformal blocks in this case is not that easy. Okay? Um, yeah. Yes? Yeah. Not necessarily. You could you could have uh, you could have um, x's sandwiched in between uh, multiplied by gamma matrices. Right. So you can yeah yeah. So you can you can have you know for instance you can have things like x1 minus x2 mu multiplied by gamma mu alpha beta. Divided yeah. It should, it should be you should not scale with distance divided by absolute value of x1. Two. But of course, only very specific combinations are in, in very conformally invariant. Um, like a that, uh, I the uh, that would be for the two-point function of the spinners. Yeah. Um, okay. So, okay, this is pretty, pretty a, bit, a bit complicated. Um, and um, maybe I shouldn't um, explain it in a lot of detail. Um, one can compute these conformal blocks. Um, so these can be computed. They're just determined by group theory, so they can, of course, be computed. Um, um, they can also be related to the scalar conformal blocks by acting with some derivative operators on the scalar conformal blocks. Now one can figure out what these blocks are. Um, so in general, if you want conformal blocks for operators with spin, it's possible to get some of them by um, acting with some derivatives, uh, derivative operators um, on uh, scalar blocks, but uh, you may not be able to get all of them that way. You might need some other blocks from which, so you, you, there's a set of what's called seed blocks from them. So it's a set of conformal blocks that you have to, for operators with various spins, that you actually have to compute. And then from those, you can act with certain differential operators to get uh, conformal blocks from, for general operators with spin. Anyway, this gets very complicated. Um, so, okay, so this is the conformal block decomposition. Crossing, what does crossing do? Well, mix this together, the GIs. And um, one can choose these TIs, these four point structures. Um, such that they have nice transformation properties under crossing. So Ti, when one is interchanged with three, um, is plus or minus Ti. Um, I think out of the five, you can take two to be uh, even and three to be odd. And um, then if you write define Fi, a B plus minus is V to the delta phi, delta psi times G A B the conformal block times um, G, G A B I of U V min plus minus U to the delta psi G A B um, I of V U. So this is the, equi the analog of this f function, which was g of uv minus g of u. One can write down the crossing equation in terms of these functions. 
And the crossing equation, I'm just going to write it schematically just so that you see, see what it looks like. And then I'll tell you what one can find using this. Okay, so the crossing equation becomes something like this, sum over i, and then sum over parity even operators with even spin, and sum over a and b, lambda, sorry, um, maybe I can write it like this, lambda 1, lambda 2. So these are the OP coefficients for operators with even spin times some matrix like this, F11, F12, F21, F22. These are the AB indices of F. Of course, everybody carries an index I. I'm not going to write that. Times lambda 1, lambda 2, plus the sum over operators with parity odd operators with, with even spin. So if I were to be more specific about the conventions, you, you'd see that it's just one of these OP coefficients that contributes, so it'd be just lambda 3 squared times F3, 3 plus sum over parity um, odd operators with odd spin, lambda 4 squared F4, 4, um, equals 0. Anyway, just to give you an idea of how complicated this is. Okay, and then you can just try to, you know, uh, find a function alpha that, that when applied to these uh, f's um, is positive. The new ingredient is that when there's a matrix there, and the condition that you want to impose is that alpha, when applied to that matrix, gives a positive semi-definite matrix. So that generalizes the condition that alpha acting on f is positive. Okay, but that can still be reduced to a um, semi-definite programming um, problem. Three is odd. Three and four are odd. One and two are even. Oh, uh, spin. The spin is even. Oh, sorry. The upper index on the operators is the parity. The what's even or odd is the spin. because they have different spin. So if you look at this three-point function in more detail, you'll see that the thing that has the index a equal to three is non-zero only for even spin operators O, and the other one is non-zero only for odd spin operators O. Yeah. Anyway. Um, so let me describe the, the, what one gets if we further assume that there's an uh, O-N flavor symmetry. So let's just look at CFTs with these operators, psi, alpha, i. Why am I talking about theories with fermions and O-N global symmetry? What do I want to find? I mentioned some models at the in, in, on, on Friday with fermions that had the ON global symmetry. So the gross nouveau yukawa models, right? So good. So let me just, uh, so in these theories, if we take this OPE, psi alpha j, we can have these intermediate operators O that can transform um, in as, you know, O-N singlets, S anti-symmetric tensors A or symmetric traceless tensors, we'll just call that T. And of course you have to try several plots or think about what you might obtain if you um, think about um, if you try to 
uh, find bounds on the scaling dimensions of um, operators in various symmetry channels. So they, the operators can transform under ON in, these, in those um, uh, representations, uh, or they can also be parity even or parity odd. So here is the most interesting plot, which is a bound, so upper bound, on lowest dimension, parity odd operator um, in a traceless symmetric representation as a function of delta psi. Delta psi i. And it starts at 1, 2. Uh, free fermion in three dimensions has dimension 1. Um, in a theory of free fermions, or we can construct an operator like this by taking a product of two fermions, psi i, psi j, and that would have dimension 2. And the bounds start here, and they look like this. So this is for n equal 2. For n equal 3, it looks like that. For n equal 4, it looks like that. For n equal 5, it looks like that. For n equal 6, it looks like that, and so on. So there's like a family of kinks that are here. And um, asymptotically at large n, this matches with a um, large n prediction from the Gerstner-Vuyu column models. So just, just to remind you, these gross and value column models are uh, the Lagrangian is this, so psi i psi i um, plus there's a scalar d mu phi squared. There's a mass term for the scalar that we tune. There's a quartic coupling. Um, and um, there's a Yukawa coupling. That's why they're called gross and Yukawa. And the operator that I'm talking about is, so this operator is um, psi i, psi j. Symmetrized and with the traces removed. Okay. Um, one reason why you know, you see a feature if you look at precisely this sector as opposed to other sectors. For example, you could have tried the um, parity odd singlet sector, where the um, operator, the lowest dimension operator is this phi. But what happens in that sector is that phi has a lower dimension in the gross Navuyukawa model than in um, theory of free fermions. So, in that case, what you find, if you, if you um, don't impose any other assumptions, you just find a bound like that that starts at the free theory and the gross nevoi column models are somewhere over here, in the, uh, deep in the allowed region. In this particular sector, um, one can actually, uh, the, the dimensions, the scaling dimensions of the operators in this sector are larger in the gross nevoi column model than in the free theory, and one can actually find these kings. Of course, one can then one can do more complicated things, but this is the. I just wanted to show you the kinks that are similar to the kinks in the Ising model for the Ising model. Okay. Other questions about this? Yes. Sorry. Um, because this is the symmetric traceless representation, and that doesn't exist when n equals 1. The only representation would be the single. Yeah, it's the same. It's the same, yeah. Would be the n and uh, the n equal two bound. Can one directly like just just the cross Navoa model like the sine i sine i squared? 
Well, size, size squared is an irrelevant operator, so you'd have to think about having a UV fixed point. A better way of thinking about it would be, I mean, you could think about it like that, close to two dimensions, when this is slightly irrelevant. Um, but uh, a better way of thinking about it, I mean, it's just the same thick fixed point. You just add a scalar, and you flow from the UV of n fermions, n1 scalar, you flow to this interacting theory. And from it, you, you can flow to the theory of free fermions by just giving a mass to the scalar. And you integrate it out, and you have free fermions. What's that? What is it? At large n, the scaling dimension of phi is 1. What is the scaling dimension of phi? Um, I believe it's, um, it's smaller than 1. Yeah. Yeah, it's smaller than 1 because what happens is that when n is equal to 1, um, so, uh, if you just have n equal 1, it's believed that the IR fixed point has n equal 1 supersymmetry. So then there's a n equal 1 multiplet. And the scalar is the bottom component of the multiplet. And it would have, the scalar would have dimension equal to the dimension of fer the fermion minus a half. And the fermion would have dimension approximately 1, maybe a little bigger than 1. So then the scalar would have dimension a little bigger than a half, such that it's, half, it's less by um, 0.5 from the fermion. And, uh, right. Uh, phi and psi i, psi i are the same operator. They're not different operators. I guess another way of saying it is that um, uh, the equation of motion for phi relates psi i psi i to something in terms of phi. So you should only think about, I mean, thinking about this operator as phi or psi i psi i is probably not very good. I mean, this can be made precise at large n, but at finite n, it's just a mixture of these. That's the, the operator with a um, well-defined scaling dimension. Okay. Um, so then I wanted to show you another example with supersymmetry. Um, so superconformal field theories in three dimensions are invariant under a superalgebra, which is OSP N4. This contains as a subalgebra SON and SO3, comma 2. That's the same thing as SP4. That's the um, that's the reason for the notation. So this is the conformal algebra, and this is the uh, this is R symmetry. And in addition to, uh, so they all have some global symmetry, which is S O N. And in addition to this, they have um, fermionic generators, uh, and that's four N um, real supercharges. Uh, it's 4n because we're just multiplying this n by this 4n, we get 4n. Um, so the supercharge is transformed in the vector representation of SON. Um, and there's um, half of them are like this, Q alpha i, where alpha goes from 1 to 2 and i goes from 1 to n. So alpha goes from 1 to 2 and i goes from 1 to n. Um, and half of them are like this, S, I, alpha. Um, and they're all Majorana spinners. The difference between Qs and Ss is that the anti-commutator of two Qs is uh, P. And uh, so there's uh, these uh, supercharges, the Qs square to uh, um, momentum. And um, the S is square to, super uh, to special conformal generators. And I guess, as far as conformal field theories are concerned, um, what's important about them is that the anti-commutator with the dilatation operator, so dQ is 1 half Q, 
and ds is minus one half s. So if we act with q on an operator, it raises the scaling dimension by a half. And if we act with s on an operator, it lowers the scaling dimension by a half. Um, okay. And now the operators transform in representations of this algebra. These representations, of, of course, can be decomposed into representations of the conformal algebra. Um, so, uh, yeah, so the operators transform in representations of um, OSP and 4, and each uh, of these representations contains a finite number of conformal representations. So in a superconformal multiplet, there's a finite number of conformal primaries. There's one that's more special than the others, which is the superconformal primary, which has the property that when put at the origin, it's annihilated by uh, S. The conformal primaries have the property that when put at the origin, they're annihilated by K. So in this multiple, there's one operator that's annihilated by S. That's a superconformal primary. And then we can just act on it with Qs. So we start with a superconformal primary. And we act with Q. And we get various operators, O prime, O double prime. Then we can act with Q again. And we get more, uh, more complicated operators. Okay, um, so the the lowest one would have scaling dimension delta. The next one delta plus a half. The next one delta plus one, and so on. Some of the operators that we get are going to be conformal descendants. Um, some of them would be conformal primaries, but there's just a finite number of conformal primaries. Um, okay. So this is typically what the situation looks like. There are special representations um, for which some of the Qs annihilate the conformal primary. So there exist shorter representations for which some Qs annihilate of a conformal primary. And it's these representations that um, one actually has more control over. Um, so the number of supersymmetries in three dimensions can go from one, two, three, four, all the way up to eight. And uh, the more supersymmetry there is, the more control there is over these short representations. Shorter is, so a generic representation is start with the superconformal primary and then we act with any Q we want. We get some other operator and, then, and so on. And we build the representation. There are shorter representations where some of the Qs annihilate the superconformal primary. So we have several operators to in total in, in this multiplet. Okay. And an example of that is uh, that of Cairo multiplets. And um, so let me just do a specific case where, so let me, let me try to discuss n equal 2, where uh, we can have Cairo multiplets. They contain a complex scalar and a fermion. So these are complex. And um, uh, these are short multiplets because uh, the this scalar is annihilated by uh, half of the supercharges, half of the Qs, sorry. Um, OK. So um, in n equal 2, the R symmetry is SO2R. In general, it's SON. In this case, it's SO2. 
And one can work out unitarity bounds just like for the, um, for just conformal field theories. And um, one finds that if you want your operator, the superconformal primary, to be annihilated by half of the Qs, then its scaling dimension is fixed given its R charge, in terms of its R charge. So the property, the R charge meaning the charge under this SO2R. Okay, you can think of SO2 as U1. It just rotates the scalar by a phase, just multiplies it by a phase. So um, in SCFTs, chiral primaries, scalars have dimension equals to the R charge. Well, right. If they're anti-chiral, the R charge is negative and the dimension is minus the R charge. And then I wanted to show you what happens if you try to bootstrap SCFTs, n equal two SCFTs, with a chiral um, scalar, well, chiral multiplet of R charge R. Again, this is equal to the scaling dimension of the scalar in that multiplet. The fermion would have the same, it would, be, it would have the scaling dimension delta plus a half. So, um, what do we need to do? Well, this scalar is complex. So we can write it as phi 1 plus i phi 2. And then look at the four-point function, phi i, phi j, phi k, phi l. So this is, so look at this. And this is like the, like theories with O2 symmetry. So we developed this whole formalism for theories with ON symmetry, so we can just apply it to this. What's different is that um, some of the, um, when we do the conformal block decomposition, some of the operators, some of the conformal primaries that appear in the conformal block decomposition um, are going to be related to, to one another by supersymmetry. So their OP coefficients would be related. Okay? So some OPE coefficients of conformal primaries are related by supersymmetry. So this gives the notion of superconformal blocks where we use those relations and we only sum over the superconformal primaries. Um, but okay, one this requires a lot of details. Let me just um, show you what happens if we try to put a bound on the lowest um, scalar that's a singlet under O2 as a function of delta phi. Okay, so upper bound. on um, SO2 singlet scalar. Well, it sort of looks very similar to these other ones. So there's a kink somewhere. It sort of looks like this. There's actually two other features. There's some, some kink here and some other kink here. Those are well, this one's not very well understood. This one is just, uh, I think, a numerical artifact. Um, and, uh, but this one is interesting because this appears precisely when the dimension of the scalar is two-thirds. Okay? And the theory that sits here um, is uh, n equal, the n equal two superizing model. 
So the n equal to generalization of the Ising model. Okay. I can try to explain what this theory is. So it's a supersymmetric theory. It has scalars and fermions. And I can try to explain why the dimension or the R charge. So this is the dimension of this ex of this scalar phi is the same as its R charge. And I can try to explain why it's equal to two thirds. Okay. So what is the n equal to surprising model? Uh, it is the theory of a free chiral multiplet. So one chiral multiplet. Well, it's not going to be free. One chiral multiplet, let's just call it phi. It has a scalar and a fermion. Uh, we can think of having a free chiral multiplet and then we can add some interactions. And then in infrared, we flow to a conformal field theory. So the interactions are given by a superpotential term, which is W of phi is some coupling of times phi cubed. In case you're not familiar with this, I can try to write down exactly what the Lagrangian is. This Lagrangian is this. We have a kinetic term for phi. Phi is complex. We have a kinetic term for chi. Chi is complex. And then we have a term that is a derivative of the superpotential as a function of little phi, quantity squared. And then we have another term that is the second derivative of the superpotential with respect to phi times chi chi. And then we have its complex conjugate, the derivative of W bar with respect to phi bar, second derivative chi bar chi bar. So in this case, you know, there's a quartic coupling for these scalars. This is g times phi absolute value to the fourth. Oh, I'm sorry, g squared. And uh, this term gives g phi chi chi. And this term gives g, if g is real, it gives g phi bar chi bar chi bar. So you can think of this model as, uh, as this theory, as a theory of one complex scalar, one complex fermion, with some interactions. And it flows in the infrared to a um, conformal fixed point, and um, it's actually a super conformal fixed point, it has supersymmetry, and actually the supersymmetry is preserved everywhere along the RG flow. Okay. So I can try to explain briefly um, how you can see that the uh, R charge of um, phi, or its scaling dimension, is equal to two thirds. We just have to think about the, sup the symmetries that are preserved by this um, action. So recall that the, I said that the, these Qs have an index I and an index alpha. I goes from one to two. They transform in the fundamental representation of SO2. So we can form these combinations. Q plus minus alpha, which is Q1 alpha plus minus I Q2 alpha. And now Q plus has charge plus one and Q minus has charge minus one. Um, so Q alpha plus raises the R charge if we think about it as, an, uh, U, as a U1 charge by one unit, and Q alpha minus lowers it by one unit. The condition for a chiral multiplet is that Q plus annihilates the scalar phi. So the only thing that can happen is to lower it. So I said before that chiral multiplet, for chiral multiplet, the superconformal primary is annihilated by some of the Qs. The precise condition is that for a chiral multiplet, 
um, Q plus annihilates the scalar. Okay? So, if phi has charge, R charge, R, then chi has R charge, well, chi is obtained by acting with the Q minus on phi. Q minus has R charge minus one, so it lowers the R charge by one unit. So high, chi has R charge minus one, R minus one. But then the question is, what is R? Well, R is such that this symmetry where phi, so the, symmet the symmetry phi goes to e to the i alpha r times phi, and chi goes to e to the i alpha r minus 1 times phi, where alpha is just a transformation parameter. We want this to be a symmetry of this Lagrangian. Multiplication by a phase is certainly a symmetry of this term, is certainly a symmetry of this term, and of this term. The only questionable term is this one. And this is going to fix the value of r. So the phase that we get from phi is proportional to r. And the phase that we get from each chi is proportional to r minus 1. So we have 2 times r minus 1 is equal to 0. And then we can solve this equation for r. So we have 3r equal 2. So that means that r is equal to 2 thirds. And then the scaling dimension, as I said, for uh, superconformal um, uh, prime, for chiral multiplets, the scaling dimension is equal to R charge, to the R charge. So that's the reason why the kink is at two thirds. Okay. Um, well, I'm not going to have time to explain how to calculate various things, but um, um, I do want to mention that in, in superconformal field theories, uh, one can actually um, calculate uh, the uh, R charges um, of chiral operators using a procedure called F maximization. Um, and from that, one can also extract correlation fu two point functions of conserved currents. From the two point functions of the conserved currents, one can obtain also, um, well, with some, maybe it's better to say that one can calculate the um, OP coefficients um, with which the conserved currents appear, say, in the phi times phi bar OP. Okay? Well, I'm obviously not going to have time to explain it. I wrote some notes on it, so I, I'll just I'll just post these. Um, uh, they're probably very very rough. Um, I should point you to some references. Um, anyway, the, the, but the main message is that in, in supersymmetric uh, field theories, there are some quantities that we can actually calculate, and then we can, um, when we see a kink or something like this, we can check against these quantities that we calculated, see if, if, if it matches. So that would be a test. Or we can also um, use these quantities that we can calculate exactly as inputs for the, for the conformal bootstrap and then perhaps get better bounds. In using methods like this, it's possible to show that um, O n, uh, that generalizations, n equal to generalizations of the O n vector models, so by n equal to I mean with n equal to supersymmetry, generalizations of the O n vector models, these must have um, some accidental or enhanced symmetries in the infrared by just combining all these techniques. Okay? Anyway, hopefully I gave you an idea of what CFTs in uh, three dimensions look like. Uh, there are many things I didn't say, but well, time is short. Anyone? So it's not like we can go home and reproduce those plots. You need a supercomputer. 
Um, it would be good to have um, at least several computers so that you have a cluster. Um, but these plots, the ones that, well, the ones with the, for the fermions, those take a while to generate. Um, this one or the one for the Ising model, those don't. Uh, yeah, yeah, I guess so. Yeah, it depends on for the Ising model for sure. Yeah, um, I mean it's not going to be instantaneous. You're going to have to wait a while, but uh, you know, uh, you could. Overnight. Yeah, overnight you could do it. Okay. Yeah. Well, uh, also it matters like with what precision do you want you want to get it like. Oh, that would be fast. That that would be fast. That that I, I don't I don't think that's uh, that's overnight. That's less than that, probably like half an hour, an hour, on that order with SDPB. If you want to get like whatever they they did, they got like six digits. Well, then <laughs> you should re you should not use your laptop. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, it's it's possible. Like, no, no one's looked at it yet in these models, or for the fermions. Yeah, so no one's done mixed correlators for the theories with fermions or for these theories. What's the subtle? Oh, for theories with fermions, as as you saw, for just a single correlator, it looks extremely complicated. So doing mixed correlators would be even more complicated. Uh, we are working on doing mixed correlators between one fermion and one scalar. Hopefully, we'll be able to um, nail down this n equal one superizing model um, more um, more precisely. The GNY theory with n equal one, which is supposed to have supersymmetry. Um, for this one, I don't think anyone's done any um, um, uh, mixed correlators. What would be good to do would be to do the mixed correlator between this external operator and which is chiral and this lowest um, scalar that appears um, that, that that's uh, R charge neutral, which is not chiral, which is part of a long multiplet. So for that, I think the first thing to understand would be the superconformal blocks. I don't think that's completely understood. Oh, sorry. So, okay, um, two scalars and two. Right. Yeah. That's that's what that's what I was saying about mixed correlators between scalars and fermions. That's what we're trying to do. Yeah. Right. 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 But uh, you, you can't just have two scalars and two fermions by itself. You have to combine it with four fermions and four, you know, a four-point function of the fermions and a four-point function of the scalars, and study that system of correlation functions. Yes. Yeah. Well, there's certainly several kinks around that don't correspond to any known theories. For instance, the the one over here is I didn't draw it very well, but there is a kink over here, and this is one of them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, it's it's not it's not so clear. I, I think people, you know, optimistic people believe that yes, it does correspond <laughs> to, to a specific theory. But um, so far, there hasn't been like a clear discovery. Um, no, but it would be very hard to tell that you've really discovered. A theory that's consistent. Yeah. Right. You can you can try to look at the various dim yeah I don't know try to look at scaling dimensions try to look at yeah the spectrum of operators. It would be good to have it would be good to have a guess of as to what the that those theories are. Um, right. Yeah, even for the gross nouveau yukawa models, I think there are some additional kinks that might correspond to an additional fixed point. 
in the, actually in the four minus epsilon expansion, you can see an additional fixed point. Um, but that that's there only. Oh, geez, I forget whether only for small values of n or for large values of n. Um, anyway, so in the uh, d equal three plots, there is an additional kink, and maybe it corresponds to this additional fixed point, but it's not it's not clear. So that would be another dis you know, discovery of a, of a theory where we might actually have an idea of what that fixed point might be. Yeah. Um, by the central charge, you mean the normalization of the two-point function of the stress tensor? Yes, that's right. That's one of the OPE coefficients, actually, in the way in the way I phrased it. The reason for that, so if you remember that what really multiplies the conformal block, G delta L, is this OPE coefficient, phi phi O, squared divided by the normalization of the two-point function of that operator O. So if you look at the stress tensor, that means delta equals 3, L equals 2. This is the stress tensor, and this is T. What you mean, so this, the two-point function of the stress tensor, T mu nu, T rho sigma, would be proportional to CT. What you mean by CT is um, this coefficient provided that um, the OPE of phi phi t, the o, this OPE coefficient is simple, provided that the stress tensor is canonically normalized. So when it acts on some field, it just um, you know, some canonical expression multiplying by that, multiplying that field. It's com com the same for all theories, right? So in that case, you would know this, and what multiplies the conformal block is essentially one over that CT. So for instance, if you put a bound on this OP coefficient, I explain how to put lower bound, how to put upper bounds on these OP coefficients, you'd find a lower bound on CT. Oh, geez, I don't remember the numbers, but, but, but people computed this. Right. This, is one, this is one piece of information that we actually have about these theories. We, we, know, we know these, uh, these uh, central charges. Um, right. By the way, if you put a lower bound on CT for um, theories like the Ising model with just one, uh, you know, just... Um, by looking at one four-point function, um, you find that the, the Ising model minimizes the CT. But it's not clear whether that's a principle or it just so happens in that case that it minimizes CT. Oh yeah, sounds good. Intergenerational.